The final part of our training is on the comparison of the goods and services. So the similarity of the goods and services when we're comparing those into trademarks. We're going to look at this from a different, different points of view. First of all, we're going to look at the legal framework and the main rules which make up the comparison of goods and services. We're then going to look at what identity of goods and services is. Following this, we'll look at similarity of goods and services, and then we'll look at a few particular scenarios. So first of all, the legal framework and the main rules. In the EU IPO, this is uh, governed by Article 81A. The comparison of goods and services is, is of rele relevance mostly for the assessment of identity uh, because it's actually a requirement, it's a legal requirement. And the outcome of the comparison plays an important role in defining the part of the public for whom likelihood of confusion is analysed because the relevant public is that of the goods and services found to be identical or similar. Goods and co a comparison of goods and services can also be for identifying the identity or close relation or equivalence of commercial terms in goods and services. It could be used for the use of a subsequent trademark where that might, might be prohibited, or also whether the consumer would perceive a link between the marks. So these are the elements that which we have to take into account. How are we going to do this? Well, we have to take an objective approach to this. We know that this is all going to be based on the NIST classification, which as far as the office is concerned, actually only serves administrative purposes. And so it doesn't actually draw any basis for um, providing a conclusion as to whether the goods and services are actually similar themselves. The fact that goods and services are listed in the same class as the NIST classification isn't actually in any indication of similarity itself. Uh, as far as the goods are concerned, we use this to refer to any kind of item that can be traded, including raw and semi-finished products, natural manufactured products. There are also some goods uh, which are intangible, such as electricity. And then services are basically any activity or benefit that one party can offer to another, and that these are intangible and don't actually result in the transfer of ownership of any physical object. In contrast to this, uh, 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 to goods, services are always intangible. It's, all, it's very necessary to note that services comprise economic activities which are provided to third parties. So if you've got advertising of your own products, this doesn't actually con constitute advertising itself. Likewise, if you design your own products, you're not actually providing that service to a third party. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it, they, these are actually design ser um, services. They need some kind of econ independent economic value. That, that means that services are normally provided in exchange for some sort of monetary compensation or some sort of compensation. At least. So the objective approach is that the comparison of the goods and services has to be based on the wording as indicated in the respective lists of goods and services. This is really important. So it's actually the words that are there that we have to take into account. The actual or intended use, which isn't stipulated in the goods and services, isn't actually relevant for this comparison. So it's, it's going to be part of the assessment of likelihood of confusion, not the assessment of the comparison of the goods and services. The comparison of the goods and services also has to be uh, taken into it has to be done without taking into account the degree of similarity of the different signs. Again, this is a different part. When we're looking at the, uh, the list of goods and services, that is the only thing that we're looking at. So that's the objective approach that we um, uh, have to take. We also have to take into account well-known facts. So these um, would be the realities of the marketplace, such as the established customs in the relevant field of industry or commerce. The degree of similarity of goods and services is a matter of law, which has to be assessed ex officio by the office, even if the parties don't comment on, on it. However, we also have to take into account um, the arguments of the parties, um, and so any, any of the evidence that they actually supply, we will also have to, uh, to look at. Um, so these are the three different uh, things that we have to look at, the objective approach, the well-known facts, and also the arguments are there in order to come to some kind of assessment of the comparison of the goods and services. This assessment will lead us to two possible outcomes, either identity or similarity, and we're going to deal with these in separate sections. Identity is relatively straightforward. If, for example, in an earlier sign, we have the term footwear, we can see that that is identical to shoes. It doesn't really matter that the terms are not the same. What actually counts is the term itself. So this goes back to the objective that we um, uh, approach that we actually 
took. Identity is defined as being the condition of being the same in substance, composition, nature, properties, or in particular, qualities uh, under consideration. So there we know that that's actually the case for the footwear or for the shoes. These are exactly the same thing. What we don't need to take into account is any of the idea of similarity, the factors of similarity. Identity is just identity. One of the things that needs to be taken into account, though, is that the class in, in which the goods are. If the go goods are actually in different classes, even if they have identical wording, they can't be found identical. The different class will actually show us that the context is different and will show us that the goods cannot actually be the same. So therefore, if we have, for example, drills in class seven, these will never be found identical to drills in class eight. The fact that the ones are in class seven will be power operated has to be taken into account. And the fact that the drills in class eight are hand operated will make them not identical to the ones in class seven. Likewise, if we've got lasers in class nine, these can't be found identical to the lasers that are in class 10. The lasers in class nine would only be normal lasers, whereas those in class 10 are specifically for medical purposes. So again, here we cannot have identity. The same thing would be found if we had tea in class 30 or medicinal tea in class five. We know very well that medicinal tea would be specifically to make you better, whereas the tea would have a different purpose in class 30. So these goods would not be seen as being identical. In all of these cases, let's remember that we are looking at identical. The fact that the goods aren't identical doesn't necessarily preclude the fact that they could be found similar. But we'll be looking at this a little bit later. Identity exists not only when the goods and services completely coincide, which means that the same terms or synonyms are used, but also when the contested goods services fall within the goods or services of the earlier mark. And likewise, when the earlier marks fall within the contested goods. This is something which actually has to be looked at very carefully indeed to see whether there is identity or not. And it's going to be the scope of the terms that are used which will actually determine this. Examples here would be for uh, would if we had in one mark non-alcoholic beverages and in another lemonade. We know that lemonade is non-alcoholic beverage and so therefore this would be seen as being identical. Or, for example, if we had household textiles and tablecloths, both of those exist in class 24, the broad term household textiles would be seen as being wider than tablecloths, but the goods are basically identical because one would be covered by the other. There might also be identity when two broad categories under comparison partially overlap. This is important for uh, terms which are quite broad. So if, for example, we have, the, uh, we have outdoor clothing for women in one of the marks and clothing made of leather in another one of the marks, we can see that one of them is specifically for women. We can see the other is specifically leather. However, there is a point at which they will overlap, which will be the outdoor clothing made of leather, which is specifically for women. And there, there is the overlap. And so here we can see that there would be identity for that particular part. Likewise, if we have black tea in one of the marks and tea bags in the other, the overlap would be there definitely, which would be tea bags containing black tea. And again, so therefore we would be, we would be finding identity. We can't actually filter these goods. We can't actually separate them there. And so there actually has to be overlap. Uh, can't we, as we can't actually di dissect the categories of of the goods, we would actually have to find them to be identical. Now, one of the things which I mentioned at the beginning of this slide was the idea of broad terms. This is especially important when we've got, for example, the general indications of the NIST classification. We know that the general indications can, can contain a large number of terms, and so sometimes we will have to find an overlap here, given the, the fact that the scope of the terms can actually be so broad. So that is identity. Of course, this is relatively easy, but I think you'll agree that once we move on to similarity, things will become a little bit more difficult. Identity means that the two things are the same. Similarity will obviously have different levels and different aspects which will have to be taken into account. These are called normally the canon criteria, the aspects that have to be taken into account for similarity after the canon case. Um, generally speaking, Two terms are defined as being similar when they have some characteristics in 
common. And these characteristics were outlined in, uh, by the Court of the European Court of Justice in the canon judgment, which is why we call them the canon criteria. The factors in the can uh, canon criteria were the nature, the intended purpose, the method of use, complementarity and competition. In addition to these, we, actually, we also add additional factors, distribution channels, the relevant public and the usual origin of the goods and services. So what we're going to do, given the fact that we've actually managed to identify all of these different factors, is to go through them to see exactly how they work. We'll start off with the nature. What exactly is it? The nature is actually the essential quality of um, a product or the kind of activities that could go to make up a service. So if we have, for example, tea, it's a plant-based beverage. Um, it can also be in powder form or in leaf form. It can be the form of a tea bag. But then the question is, does it have a separate nature, a similar nature to coffee? I think you'd agree that it probably would. They're, they are actually relatively similar things, but we know that they're definitely not identical. Likewise, if we've got bananas, bananas uh, can be a fresh fruit in class 31, or it can be processed in class uh, 29. But does it have the same natures as peaches or apples? These are the kind of things that we have to take into account when we're looking at the nature. Or if we take into account the restaurant, these normally in a restaurant, you, uh, they are providers of food and drink. But would we actually find them similar in nature if, we, if in the other mark we had temporary accommodation services? Again, the nature of the services would probably tell us that not. A variety of features of the goods in question have to be used to define their nature. These include, for example, the composition, meaning the ingredients or the materials of, what, of which they're made. So yogurt, for example, is a milk product. Um, and so that would be what we, how we would define it. We would define the nature of yogurt as being a dairy product. This is what we're looking into, the actual composition of it. Likewise, you can see that some things may be made of the same things, but they wouldn't be found as being similar. So if we had a chair in class 20 or a doll in class 28, now both of these can be made of plastic, but they're not of the same nature because a chair is a piece of furniture and then a toy is obviously, a, a doll is obviously just a toy. They belong to completely different categories. They don't have the same nature, even if they might actually be made of the same thing. Likewise, if we look at washing machines, we could have um, washing machines using washing powder so that would be seen as being a chemical functioning principle. Now, we also have washing machines using, mechan um, using magnetic waves. Now, they wouldn't actually have the same functioning if they were using magnetic waves as they would do if they were used. But they are actually of the same nature, the two different types of washing machines, because they've actually got the same function. They, and so therefore, we would see them as being similar. The nature of services can be defined in particular by the kind of activity which is provided to third parties. And in most cases, it's this category under which the service falls that defines the nature. So if we take, for example, taxi services, they could have the same nature as bus services, as they're both actually transport services. By their nature, goods are generally dissimilar to services. This is because goods are articles, uh, articles of trade or wares or merchandise and their sale usually entails the transfer in title of something physical and services on the other hand consist of intangible activities so that shows you why goods are normally seen as not being similar to services. If we look at the purpose and method of use then what we're looking at is what for and how. This is the, the reason for something which is uh, the reason that something is done or is made. As a kind of factor the purpose normally means the intended use of the goods or services, not any other possible use. So if we had tea leaves, for example, used for beauty purposes, um, then that's one thing. But if we have tea leaves used for making beverages, that's something completely different. So we're looking at what for, what is the need, what problem do they actually solve? The method of use determines the way in which the goods and services are used to achieve their purpose. And it often follows directly from the nature or the intended purpose of the goods and services, and therefore has got little significance on its own in the similarity um, analysis. But the method of use can be important um, when, when it characterizes the use. Here we've got the examples on the screen. We've got pharmaceutical preparations, which would be used in one way, 
but they won't actually necessarily have the same uh, nature, but they can be uh, have the same method of use as cosmetic creams, meaning they're just put on the screen. So this is put on the skin. So this is what needs to be taken into account. Complementarity is another one of the character, uh, account and char- uh, factors. Complementarity is a close connection when one uh, is essential or important for the use of another in the way that consumers could actually think that the responsibility for the production of those goods or services lies with the same undertaking. By definition, goods intended for different publics can't actually be complementary. So if we've got leather or leather goods or raw coffee or coffee for brewing, then we've got different publics there. So therefore, one would not actually be complementary to the other. Complementary isn't usually conclusive on its own for finding similarity of goods and services. And even where a degree of complementarity exists, goods and services can't, uh, may actually be dissimilar. Because other factors would be necessary. So if we've got, for example, tea cups on the one hand, but tea bags on the other, we do need a tea cup to make a cup of tea and to use the tea bag. But in fact, we wouldn't actually see it as being one complementary to the other. Likewise, if we have tea and biscuits, maybe you do like to have a biscuit with your cup of tea, but again, they wouldn't be seen as being complementary. And in any case on their own, it is not actually necessarily just a conclusive for finding the similarity. Another factor would be whether the goods are seen as being in competition. If they're in competition, one of the goods or services can substitute the other. It means that they probably serve the same or similar purpose and are offered to the same potential customers. It means that they're basically interchangeable. Examples of this, on the screen we see butter and oil, they could be seen as being interchangeable. Or if we have wallpaper and paints, again, they're in competition because they could both be used for covering or decorating walls. The same thing can be done with uh, services. So if on the one hand we have rental of movies and on the other hand we have services of a a cinema, these are in competition because both of them allow you to watch uh, a film. So it means that, in fact, we can actually judge for competition both for services and for good. And um, these would have to be relative criteria. Likewise, the distribution channels. It should be noted that this isn't actually one of the criteria in the Canon case, but it is something which is uh, widely used for the comparison of goods and services. If the goods or services are made available through the same distribution channels, the consumer would be more likely to assume that they're actually in the same market sector and are possibly manufactured or provided by the same entity and vice versa. Doesn't necessarily refer so much to the way of selling or promoting the company's product, but very much to the place of distribution. So do they have the same points of sale? Are they normally provided or offered at the same or similar places? Obviously, nowadays, this becomes somewhat complicated as we have supermarkets, which may offer a a very wide variety of products. In this case, we would actually only see it as being relevant because you would find the goods probably in the same section of the supermarket rather than the goods being found in a supermarket itself. Likewise, we look at the relevant uh, public, and diverging customers can be found in a number of different cases. So if the goods and services of both lists are directed at the same public, at the public at large, and they can therefore be categorized by their different ages or needs, etc. So also, if the goods and services of both lists target business customers, for example, who may be ex- uh, acting in a very different sector, these would be seen as being different publics. So if we've got, a, uh, for example, chemicals used in forestry versus solvents for the lacquer industry, these would be seen as being very different products indeed. If we've got one of the relevant publics consists of, consisting of general consumers and then uh, the other business con- uh, customers, this also would show us that the relevant public is possibly different. So an example of that would be contact lenses, for example, in one class versus surgical apparatus um, in another. The customers here would be completely different. The contact lenses would be for the general public, whereas the surgical apparatus would be for a very specified public indeed. Again, these are the factors that need to be taken into account and to to be discussed whether uh, if the goods or services are seen to be similar or not. And here we can actually see how the, um, the, the, the customers work. 
We're looking not only at the average consumer, but it, uh, but also the general public and the con uh, and the professional public. And we're looking at actual and potential customers. And so it doesn't necessarily mean the end user. So in the case of baby food or diapers, obviously the end user would be the baby, but not necessarily the person who would actually buy it. And the mere fact that the potential customers coincide doesn't actually automatically constitute an indication of similarity. The same group of customers may be in need of the goods or services of the most diverse origin and nature. And in many cases, either one or both of the lists of goods and services in, uh, co under comparison target the public at large, but the purpose of covering the customer's needs would, might be different in each case. And such circumstances would, be, would weigh against finding similarity. While a coincidence in the relevant public isn't necessarily an indication of similarity, largely diverging publics weigh heavily, heavily against the finding of similarity. Likewise, we have to look at who is the producer or the provider. Again, this is not a, a factor in the Camden case, but it is something that's frequently used. There's a strong indication of similarity when in the mind of the relevant public, the goods or services have the same usual origin. Origin in this context re uh, relates mainly to the manufacturing sector, so the person who would actually make the goods, or the kind of undertaking producing the goods or offering the services in question, rather than to the identity of the producer. So there, if we've got the same maker, we would probably see, we would be more inclined to find similarity. Or if we have the same service provider, also this would be the case. There is quite a lot of interrelation in these factors. In many cases, there'll be a relationship between them in the sense where one is actually shared, another one might actually coincide to, uh, as well. So based on the purpose, it's also possible to determine who the actual and potential customers are. The purpose combined with the relevant public may also reveal whether the goods and services are in competition. The same distribution channel goes hand in hand with the same public. And where the distribution channels are different, the public may also be different. So goods and services intended for different um, publics can't actually be complementary. And the method of use usually depends very much on the nature of per or purpose of the goods. And so the interrelation of all of these factors is going to be seen to be very important to be able to find degrees of similarity. And I say degrees of similarity because, in fact, we must bear into, in mind the weight of the different factors. The comparison should focus on uh, identifying the relevant factors that specifically characterise the goods and services to be compared. And therefore, the relevance of a particular factor depends on the respective goods and services. And in assessing the similarity, all of the relevant factors need to be taken into account. So, for example, if we were comparing skis and ski boots, it would be evident that they don't actually coincide in their nature. One is skis, the other are boots, or in their method of use, and they aren't actually in competition. Therefore, what we'd need to do is to focus on their purpose, and their complementary character and their distribution uh, channels and their usual origin and their usual public. So those are the factors which would actually have to be weighed up. We don't actually have to list all of the necessary, uh, all of the possible factors, but what does matter is that we can actually create a sufficient connection between the goods that are um, to find similarity in them. So how will the goods and services be used? What's their purpose? How likely uh, is it that they can si uh, coincide in producers? Are they usually found in the same outlets or in the same department, uh, uh, departments of, di of larger stores or in the same section of the supermarket? Is the origin th the same? Would the purpose be the same? Is the nature the same? Is there complementarity? All of these need to be weighed up and they need to be, uh, to be seen in their in, uh, different um, types of importance in order to be able to see whether the goods and services are similar. At EU IPO, what we do is to actually have different degrees of similarity and to say, and so we're able to say whether things are highly similar, similar to a normal level or similar to a low degree. So these also, we can see that some of the, 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 the factors uh, would be given more weight than others. We move on to a couple of particular scenarios. First of all, for complementarity, we, we very much uh, rely on complementarity to distinguish, to distinguish where goods and services are merely used together, and whether we're by choice or by convenience. So, for example, bread and butter, they're not necessarily 
uh, essential for one another. And so therefore, similarity can only be, be actually found on the basis of other factors, not on complementarity. Some goods are often coordinated with each other, but they don't necessarily fall within the scope of other similar similarity factors. Um, we do, however, have the idea of aesthetic uh, complementarity, where one might actually go with another from an aesthetic point of view. So therefore, you might actually find this degree of com complementarity between, for example, handbags in class 18 and clothing in class 28. There would be some sort of aesthetics there, which would allow us to, to find some degree of similarity between these particular goods. Likewise, uh, the mere fact that one of the products is used for the manufacture of another won't be sufficient in itself uh, to show that the goods are similar, as their nature, purpose, relevant public and distribution channels could be quite diff uh, different. So if we've got raw materials which are subjected to a transformation process, these are essentially different from the finished products themselves. Um, because in this case, raw plastics wouldn't be seen to be the same as a, a finished plastic box. Raw materials as a sufficient, uh, as significantly important basic component of an end product may be found similar to that product, but not on the basis of complementarity since one is manufactured with the other and the raw material in general is, uh, is generally intended for use in industry rather than direct purpose by the final consumer. Similarity could be established when the raw material or the semi-finished product could be decisive for the form or character or quality or value of the end product. But this would also go back to the idea of the main ingredient. Parts, fitting, fittings and accessories also need to be thought about. And the fact that a product could be made of several components doesn't actually necessarily uh, establish similarity between the product and its parts. They might be sold by the same undertaking, however, and they could actually target the same purchasing public, and this would be seen in the case of replacement parts. Depending on the public concerned, the public could also expect the component to be made uh, or produced by or under the control of the, in, in, of the original manufacturer which is also a factor that suggests that the goods are similar. In general, a variety of factors could be, uh, could be significant in each uh, particular case. For instance, if the component is also sold independently, or if it's particularly important for the functioning of the machine, this will very much favour similarity. So if we've got electric toothbrushes and replacement brush heads, obviously these would be seen to be similar. We go back to the idea of the uh, relevant public imagining that they would probably be produced by the same entity. Likewise, if we have printers and inkjet cartridges, again, although one is part of the other, they will be very much associated in the mind of the consumer. If we've got accessories on its own, then we wouldn't actually see this um, and, uh, as, as being accessories in general. It's a very vague and broad term indeed, and wouldn't actually be accepted by the office. We actually need to know what the accessories are for and or what the parts and fittings um, are for. The rules in respect of parts, components and fittings are to a certain extent also valid in the case of accessories. The mere fact that a certain product is used in combination with another isn't necessarily con conclusive for a finding of similarity. So dissimilarity, for example, would be found between clothing and hair ornaments or if we have vehicles on the one hand and fragrances for vehicles on the other, again, there would be no similarity there. It is common, however, for some accessories to be produced by the manufacturer of the, of the main product. So if we had bicycles on the one hand and then baskets for bicycles on the other, we could understand that they may actually be produced by the same entity. Or if we have glasses, spectacles on the one hand and cases for glasses on the other, again, we would probably expect them to be made by the same uh, entity. The fact that a, uh, a certain product can be composed of several components doesn't automatically establish similarity between the finished product and its parts. This is based on the fact that parts and fittings are often produced or sold by the same undertaking and that they, they target the same public. But depending on the public concern, they might also expect it to be produced by a different manufacturer. And so a variety of fa uh, factors can be significant in each particular case. So if the component is also sold independently or is particularly important for the functioning 
uh, of a machine, this will favor similarity. But if we've got dissimilarity, here we can see very clearly with the buttons and the clothing, you can't actually find that because the public wouldn't necessarily um, accept them, expect them to be provided by the same entity. It'll only be uh, found similar in exceptional cases. And the main uh, factors for finding the similarity, such as the producer or the public, or the complementarity would also have to be present. So these are the factors for finding similarity of how we actually do the comparison of the goods and services. I hope this has been useful for you. I very much enjoyed the presentation. And thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Thank you.